Okay, we'll get going here. And good afternoon. My name is Evan Weiner. My background is journalism, TV, radio, newspapers, magazines. I actually knew that guy, Richard Nixon. I met Nixon in 1985, and he comes back into prominence uh, in in the United States uh, 11 years after he leaves office and the way he does it is not the David Frost interviews the way he does it is he selected to be the mediator of the uh, umpire Major League Baseball owners dispute he ended up giving uh, as the arbitrator the umpires a big big raise 40 percent as a matter of fact so uh, I started dealing with him in about 1985 Dealt with him on and off for about five or six years. Uh, he became an elder statesman. But uh, Title IX is where women got equal opportunities in education as to men uh, in 1972. And the 50th anniversary of Title IX is on June 23rd uh, of this year. And uh, there is a stamp that's been put out, actually. It was put out in March. Uh, with uh, the 50th anniversary in mind. you got to remember one thing about women's education in the United States. Do you think it's a right or is it a law? Do you think women have the right to get an education, higher education, yes or no? Yes. No. no. It's the law. It's the law that women get higher education. Anyway, so there is Richard Nixon. He makes it all possible. Title IX is the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity in Education Act, the Education Amendments of 1972, or Title IX. 1971, a Hawaiian congresswoman by the name of Patsy Mink and an Oregon congresswoman by the name of Edith Green were the leaders. And uh, they wanted women to pursue their dreams without gender discrimination, and they ran with it. Um, so, Title IX of the Education Amendments is enacted by Congress, signed into law by President Richard Nixon. That is June 23, 1972. The sponsors of Title IX, the Indiana, or the Indiana Democrat, Birch Bayh in the Senate, and the Oregon Congresswoman, the Democrat Edith Green from Oregon. Title IX prohibits sex discrimination in any education program or activity receiving any type of federal aid. Now, I got a question for you because I think I could ask uh, this group this question. How many of you actually knew women who went to law school or medical school? How many? After 19, prior to 1973? No, I have no idea. No. How many? One? One. You realize in 1973 that about 7% uh, of medical school made up of women. About 9% of law school made up of women. Uh, there were quotas at various places, and uh, you could go to a uh, vet school, so to speak. And uh, I know I, I, speak, I spoke on cruise ships, and there was this one guy who said that he went to uh, University of Pennsylvania, graduated in 1965, uh, veterinarian school. He said 55 men, 10 women. And I met this guy about six, seven years ago, and he said, you know, of our 65, we just went to a reunion. We're all still alive. He said, all of the 55 men are retired. The women are still working, the 10 women. This is, of course, seven years ago or so. He said, the women were go-getters. Us men, well, we're old farts sitting around on cruise ships now. Anyway, uh, that was Title IX. Now, this is San Francisco. This is a place in San Francisco where old pinball machines are and old Nickelodeons are, are there. And uh, it's a museum. Uh, well, they call themselves a museum. They're not. But uh, it's, it's a cool old arcade place in uh, Fisherman's Wharf. And I was there two and a half years ago. And I'm looking at this, and this is pre-1960s thinking. To be happy, see what every married woman must not avoid. And you put your nickel in the Nickelodeon, and they tell you as a married woman, this is what you got to do to keep your husband happy. Make sure he stays happy. And that was the prevailing thinking. Uh, in the 1920s, remember the flappers? 
the flappers in the 1920s, the young women, uh, because in World War I, uh, there were young women who had to work munitions plants in the United States and in England. And for the first time, women said, hey, wait a minute, we're important in the workplace. Women got the right to vote around 1917, 1918, voted for the president in 1920. These were the women, the flappers, who were the modern women. A young woman uh, with a short Bob style haircut, cigarette dangling from her painted lips, dancing to a live jazz band. Flappers uh, roamed through the roaring 20s, uh, enjoying the new freedoms ushered in by the end of World War I and the dawn of a new era of prosperity, urbanism, and consumerism. Didn't last long, though. Here are a couple more flappers out on a date. Uh, the 1920s kicked off. The 19th Amendment passed. Women could vote in the United States. Women joined the workforce uh, in increasing numbers. Uh, and they were part of uh, the mass consumer culture. Bye, 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 bye. Uh, and they enjoyed more freedom in their personal lives, and it came crashing to an end in the Depression. Uh, despite the heady freedoms embodied by the flapper, real liberation and equality for women remained elusive in the 1920s, and it was back to home during the Depression. Rosie the Riveter, any of you have a mother that was Rosie the Riveter or a Rosie the Riveter? I was doing a, a talk at the Bristol, as a matter of fact, in White Plains. Uh, it was on the year 1945, and a woman said to me, my mother was that. She worked at a munitions factory during World War II. She was Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter was the star of a campaign aimed at recruiting female workers for defense industries during World War II, and she became uh, the most uh, iconic image of the working woman. American women entered the workforce in unprecedented numbers during the war. Between 1940 and 1945, the female percentage of U.S. workforce increased from 27% to 37%. And in 1945, nearly one out of every four married women worked outside the home. Norman Rockwell, Rosie the River. Uh, and there is uh, Rosie or Naomi. Naomi might have been the uh, might have been the prototype for Rosie the Riveter. Uh, Naomi Parker Fraley, who was photographed while working in a machine shop at the Naval Air Station in Alameda, California, outside of Oakland, uh, could be Rosie. In that 1942 photo, she's sporting a polka dotted bandana. Nobody knows who Rosie was for sure. But the call for women to join the workforce during World War II was only temporary. And women were expected to leave uh, their jobs once the war ended and the men came home. And they did. And women were very unhappy. Uh, 1959, this is the West Orange, New Jersey Library. Uh, and let me ask you a question, some of you maybe. Well, if you were married in the 1950s or 60s and you got your mail, say to go to a wedding or something, did it ever have your first name, just the women? Or was it Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so? It was always Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. Well, let's take a look at the West Orange Public Library, which opened in 1959, and uh, let's see who's on the library board of trustees. Uh, there was Mrs. Simon Griffinger. Mrs. Simon. She had no first name, but Samuel A. Cristiano had a first name. So did Roger W. Doring, and so did Herbert W. Dwyer. But it was Mrs. Alex J. Katz. Alex J. Katz, she had no name. She was Mrs. Uh, there was James A. Sheeran. He's the mayor of West Orange. There was Dr. Rexford S. Souther. He was the superintendent of schools. And William Lehman, who was the architect. The men all had names. The women didn't have names. Anybody want to ever be a stewardess? Ever want to be a stewardess? Well, let's see. Delta Airlines in 1965 is looking for stewardess. Welcome aboard Delta, 1965. Stewardess applicants must be between the ages of 20 and 26. 
Uh, never married, in radiant good health. Uh, most, uh, you must adhere to a strict, strict figure control standards. I was giving this speech, some, uh, this talk somewhere, uh, I was in New Jersey, as a matter of fact. It was to a seniors, uh, women's seniors club. And the woman said she tried out for United Airlines. And they used to bring a tape measure, mm -hmm. making sure that her figure was always the same and she didn't gain any weight. Uh, straight teeth, uh, clear, smooth si skin. Also, must be willing to retire between the ages of 32 or 30 or 32 to take uh, on the great complexities of marriage. So you're out of there by the age of 32. And they wage you all the time. Remember the show Password? Remember Password with Alan Ludden? There's Alan Ludden, there's Carol Burnett, there's Mitch Miller playing the game. And Alan Ludden, when there would be a female contestant, would ask, are you a working gal? And what does your husband do for a living? Well, you know, you weren't supposed to be a working gal. You were supposed to have a husband doing a job. Oh, family passports. That's my uh, in-laws in their family passport in the 1960s. There's a picture of my mother-in-law. But she's like, yeah, extra luggage. She's like the, the handbag that's coming on. Everything was in his name. Everything was in his name. And oh, by the way, here's my wife. Women were treated like second-class citizens. That's Patsy Mink. Patsy Mink is the woman who decided that uh, women needed equal education. How many women here think you were discriminated against going to college? Any? Any women think that you might have been discriminated against going to college? That you might have been able to do more than you ended up doing? Because for most women, they were nurses, teachers, secretaries, bell telephone operators. Where are any men operators? Anyway, that's Congresswoman Patsy Mink. And Patsy Mink was the woman who decided to push ahead for Title IX. She was elected the first female president of the student body at Maui High School in Hawaii, territory of Hawaii, 1944. She went to law school and then back to Hawaii. But she didn't want to be a lawyer. She wanted to be a doctor. She was politically ambitious. In 1958, she was elected to the territory of Hawaii Senate. Hawaii was still a territory. A year later, the bicameral uh, territorial legislature was dissolved when Hawaii became a state. In the special election, uh, she ran in the Democratic primary and ended up losing to Daniel Inouye. In 1962, she ran for election to the Hawaiian State Senate and was successful in her bid. Two years later, she was victorious in her uh, bid for a seat in the House of Representatives. Uh, so she's a congresswoman, right? She's entitled to all of these things that uh, congressmen have, right? Including using the House gym. So do you think she was able to use the House of Representatives gym? Yes or no? No. 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 They would not allow the women to hang out with these guys, with the Indian clubs and all that. It was a man's world. She had to fight to get to use the gym. She was a champion of women's rights. She said she wasn't a feminist. Uh, she was outspoken in her uh, opposition to the Vietnam War. Uh, in Congress, she worked on behalf of civil rights, including those of women and children health, welfare, and education. Now, why did she become this woman who wanted rights? Well, she's the valedictorian at uh, the high school, Maui High School, on the island of Maui. She goes to college, University of Hawaii. She does really well. She's one of the smartest people at the University of Hawaii. She wants to go to medical school. And uh, she applies to 12 medical schools. Guess how many medical schools accepted her? Zero. Zero. I have a friend who lives in Hawaii. Her name is Fran. Uh, and uh, we, we met on a cruise ship, uh, Fran Cummings. And her husband, Wes, was speaking on a cruise ship. And we spent 28 days together next to one another. So we became very friendly. And she was telling me that uh, she was valedictorian 
of her school in Utah <laughs> around 1956. And she had come from a large, large family of geologists. And she wanted to be a geologist. She had the marks. She had the test scores. She, she goes out there and she starts meeting with these colleges. And uh, they all say, no, 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 no. One day, she says to uh, the guy who told her, no. She says, let me ask you a question. I said, my marks. No, you're the valedictorian. And your test scores are great. Uh, OK, so it's not my marks. Uh, and I come from a family of geologists. What is it? And he says, well, Fran, you're too pretty. You're too pretty. And if you go out on an archaeological dig, the guys are going to want to look at you. And they're not going to concentrate on what they're doing. Same thing in class. You're going to sit there, and you're very pretty. And they're going to look at you instead of listening to the, prof uh, to the professor. So mm -hmm. you know, good luck in whatever you do. You're just not going to go to geology school here. And she never went to geology school. She uh, got a degree in science and ended up being a college administrator in science departments. But gender discrimination. So Patsy Mink, in her case, goes to law school. And she continued to face sexism. She's denied a job at a law firm because she was a married woman. But she was more than just a married woman. She married a guy from the mainland, which meant she was no longer an Hawaiian citizen, even though she was living in the territory of Hawaii. She tried to start her own practice. Government officials only allowed residents of Hawaii to take the bar exam. She had graduated from the University of Chicago. She met a guy by the name of John Mink while she was in Chicago. Uh, John Mink was from Pennsylvania, but the couple never lived there. They lived in Hawaii. But because she married a guy from Pennsylvania, she was considered a mainlander. Uh, so she's born and raised in Maui, but her husband John's a mainlander, so she's no longer a citizen of Hawaii. Uh, she had to fight for the right to take the bar exam. And in the end, she won. She would pass the exam and became the first Japanese-American woman lawyer in Hawaiian history. She served in Congress, 1962 to 77, and then again, 1989 to 2002. And these are the two women who changed the lives of now hundreds of millions of American women. And also, kids going to school from kindergarten to 12th grade. Patsy Mink in Edith Green. 1954, Edith Green is elected to uh, the 4th District, uh, rather the 3rd District, uh, in Oregon, Democrat. She worked on uh, women's issues, uh, education, and social reform. Question for all of you, should women be paid the same amount of money as a man for doing the same job, yes or no? Yes. Yes, yes, Definitely. yes. Definitely. Yes. Well, Anything less well, well, American. yeah, well, this is 1955, and she puts together this law saying that men have to be paid, uh, or women have to be paid equal to men uh, if they're doing the same job. 1955, John Kennedy would sign the bill into law eight years later in 1963. However, however, the law has never been applied equally. So to this day, you still have inequality between men and women doing the same job. And there is Edith Green, the Democrat for Congress. Uh, among the things that she also did, Educational Aid Library Services Act, uh, which provided um, access to libraries for rural communities. The Higher Education Act of 1963, Higher Education Act 1965, and 1967. And she was called things like the mother of higher education and Mrs. Education. Now, I went to Spring Valley Junior High School and High School back in the late 1960s in Rockland County in Spring Valley, New York. And there were programs for guys after school. But for girls, just cheerleading. Just cheerleading. And maybe, maybe the future teachers of America. And, uh, and they, they were more progressive in, in East Rand Post Central School District number two in those days. Uh, many school districts didn't offer any programs for girls after school. And she decided we need that as well and got it. Boston Marathon. 
You know, the Boston Marathon had no women. Do you know that? No women were at the Boston Marathon until 1967. And that woman there, her name is Kay Switzer. Kathleen Switzer, as a matter of fact. And she applied to run in the Boston Marathon. Uh, she grew up as the daughter of a United States uh, mate, Army major. She wasn't going to fail. Um, she goes to Syracuse University and tells the coach, I'm training for the Boston Marathon. And the coach said, you can't train for the Boston Marathon. You're a frail, dainty thing. You're a woman. Oh, Patsy Mink, when she went to uh, uh, Maui High School, she played basketball. But girls basketball in those days, you can only go 48 feet, not 96 feet. The reason why? Girls were too frail. Girls couldn't run 48 feet. Oh, that's all they could run was 48 feet. They couldn't run 96 feet. They'd be, ha, ha, ha. Which leads me to the next question. If women are the weaker sex, how come you outlive all of us men? <laughs> Is Myron Cohn. Remember Myron Cohn, yeah. the comedian? He would say, because they want to. We want to die. They want to. And there she is. Take a look at that picture if you can see it. Does it look like somebody's trying to push her into the uh, cement as she's running? Because that's what's happening. This guy here is a guy named Jock Semple. He's the head of the Boston Marathon, and he is absolutely irate that Catherine Switzer is running in it. Uh, so he's trying to push her down. The good part for Catherine Switzer is that that's her boyfriend. He's six foot two. He weighs about 235 pounds. He's a football player at Syracuse University. And he's also a nationally ranked hammer thrower. His name is Tom Miller. And Tom Miller was only running the race because his girlfriend said, I'm going to do this. And he said, well, I'm going to try to do this as well. Well, it came in handy because that guy, Jock Semple, was about ready to push Catherine uh, Switzer into the face, uh, into the floor. Oh, she finished the marathon. She won. Uh, she didn't win. Uh, she finished, which is like winning in four hours and 20 minutes. Uh, Title IX. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in being denied the benefits of or subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Now, if you are giving women the right to get an education, should that be a problem, yes or no? No. No, it was. Title IX was highly controversial. Although some supported the law, Others thought it'd be too dangerous. Why would it be too dangerous? Forcing schools to accept women would ruin American education, some felt. Now, let me ask you a question. If women went to college, is that ruining American education? Yes or no? That's what they felt. Ted Stevens was the senator from uh, Alaska. And at this point, I'm going to thank some people who helped me with this talk, uh, including Donna Deverona, who doesn't live too far from here. She's in uh, Stanford. Donna Deverona won two gold medals at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics in swimming. And uh, she's, a, she's a friend of mine who helped me out. Another one who helped me out with this talk is Nancy Hogshead Maker, who's now a professor of law at Rutgers University over in New Brunswick, New Jersey. She won a gold medal in swimming in 1984. Another person who helped me out with this was uh, Dr. Harvey Schiller, uh, who's also uh, Lieutenant Colonel Harvey Schiller, uh, retired. He flew missions in Vietnam in 1966, 67. Uh, but in the 1980s, he was the head of the Southeastern Conference of College. Uh, and he uh, opened his arms to women coming to school, to those schools. And also Shelley Saltman, who, uh, and Billie Jean King, uh, but before I get to Billie Jean King, uh, Shelley uh, was one of the five men cited by Billie Jean King uh, in the late 1970s in her magazine as having doing the most in terms of men for women's sports. 
You might remember the Bobby uh, Riggs, Billy Jean King uh, Battle of Sexes. Well, my friend, Shelly, put down the phone. You can't reach me from where you are right now. Fifteen years from now, we'll talk again. Shelly promoted uh, the Bobby uh, Riggs, Billy Jean King Network Spectacular, which Howard Cosell was uh, the moderator and MC. Uh, so those are the five people who helped me with this talk, including Billy Jean King. I never met Ted Stevens. He was the ally that Donna DeVarona said they needed. And there is Donna back in 1964. Oh, by the way, Donna tried to go to college after winning two gold medals and wanted an athletic scholarship. Now, uh, this is 1965. If you were running a college and you were giving out athletic scholarships, would you give the winner of two gold medals in swimming in the Tokyo Olympics a scholarship? And you have the marks as well? Uh, would you, yes or no? Yes. yes. She didn't get it. She didn't get it. She never got that scholarship. Uh, Donna says, without Senator Stevens as a co-sponsor, I doubt Title IX would have survived. It was a time when we needed a strong Republican. He championed the rights of athletes and protected Title IX, as well as always being there when there was a challenge to the law. Now, why would this Alaska senator by the name of Ted Stevens really care about women's education? Well, a couple of reasons. He had daughters. His daughters couldn't play Little League Baseball. He was an avid tennis player. His friends played tennis, and he knew how athletics, and this became an athletics instead of an educational uh, amendment, uh, was to be in, in professional lives and personal lives. Title IX ended up providing uh, equality in sports for women. And that's the Achilles heel of Title IX, as Donna DeVarona told me once. If we just said all educational aspects, we'd be okay. But we threw women in there. We basically itemized things, which we should not have done in 1971-72. And there is uh, Harvey, uh, and there is uh, Ted Stevens, and there is Donna DeVarona. Birch Bayh. Before I get into Birch Bayh, I want to talk about my ninth grade social studies teacher, a guy by the name of Stewie Gates, at Spring Valley Junior High School in uh, Spring Valley, New York, Route 45. This is uh, either 1969 or 1970, fall, winter 69, spring 1970, and we're all in ninth grade. And I'm 13 years old. I was thrown out of kindergarten. I was thrown in the first grade back in 1961. So I'm younger, way younger than anybody else. Everybody else is 14, going on 15. And I'm just barely 13 at this point. And uh, so Stewie says to the class, hey, we got to talk. OK, you know, and everybody's sitting there. And he says, uh, you know, uh, next year you're going up to a new building, Spring Valley High School, over on Route 59. You're all going to be sophomores, 10th grade. And you're going to take the PSATs, yeah, the practice SATs. And then in 11th grade, you're going to take the real SATs and see where your score is. And then in 12th grade, you're going to start looking for colleges. And he said, uh, I'm only talking to the women here. Boys, you don't have to listen. And again, the boys don't have to listen if they don't want to. He says, to the women here, you're going to college to get three letters. You know what those three letters were? Yeah. MRS. MRS. He told us that when we were in ninth grade in 1970. Now, this is 1972. This is the Indiana <laughs> Senator Birch Bayh. And he sounds a lot like Stewie Gates, who, by the way, is still around. He's in his 90s up in Stony Point, New York. Anyway, the misunderstanding. And this is Birch Bayh on the floor of the Senate. Uh, we're all familiar with the stereotype that women are pretty things who go to college to find a husband and who go on to graduate school because they want a more interesting husband and finally marry, have children, and never work again. The desire of many schools not to waste a man's place on a woman, on a woman stems from such stereotype notions. About 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I'm giving a talk up in Stanford. Same talk, and I read that. 
and there was a guy in the back of the room, a retired doctor. He said, can I say something? I said, sure. You know what? I have no script. You can say what you want. No problem. So he says he goes to uh, medical school in 1960. And he says that there are 96 people in the, me in the class. 92 men, four women. And uh, he says that the, the dean of the school, they were all sitting around in a circle and all that. Dean of the school says to the women, the four women, will you please stand up? They stand up. And he says, what are you doing here? Why are you here? You realize you're taking the place of a man here, that you can get your degree, but you're probably here only to find a, a, a husband. Why are you wasting our time in taking up a man's space? And I've heard that in veterinarian school graduates as well, uh, in engineering school graduates over the years, women. But the facts absolutely contradict these myths about the weaker sex. And it's time to change our operating assumptions. While the, imp the impact of this amendment would be far-reaching, it's not a panacea. It is, however, an important first step in the effort to provide for the women of America something that is rightfully theirs, an equal chance to attend the schools of their choice, to develop the skills they want, and to apply those skills with the knowledge they will have a fair chance to secure the jobs of their choice with equal pay for equal work. Well, it sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds like it's going to work. Women's rights. This is from the Henry Ford Museum, Dearborn, Michigan, which is kind of odd because Henry Ford was such a horrible human being. And yet, it's a women's rights museum. It's a civil rights museum as well. Here's women's rights in the 19th century. Women's rights denied. In the 1800s, American women had fewer rights than a male inmate in the Nassane Asylum. <laughs> women could not vote, serve on a jury, testify in court, hold public office, attend college, practice law. If a woman, if a woman were married, it was illegal for her to sign a contract, own or inherit property. Uh, keep or invest her own earnings. And she did not get rights to her children necessarily. Women were expected to be the center of the family. Uh, only the husband uh, matters. And uh, the other thing is they weren't allowed to voice strong opinions in public and they must act ladylike, whatever that was. Pre-1972, Title IX was enacted as a follow-up passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The act was passed to end discrimination in various fields based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in areas of employment and public accommodation. The 1967 Act, the 64 Act rather, did not prohibit sex discrimination against persons employed at educational institutions. In other words, if you were an adjunct professor looking for a full professorship or looking for tenure, they could say no and not tell you why they're saying no. Women students were denied equal opportunities under the law in academics. Women applicants were routinely denied equal access to medical, law, and other graduate schools. And women athletes were denied equal participation in sports. Similarly, Female faculty members were denied equal compensation and promotion. Today's rise of all women, in, uh, or women in all academic disciplines and sports at every level in many ways is a direct outgrowth of the landmark Title IX decision. And I, I did it. Uh, it was me, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon did it. Congress passed the final version of the bill June 1972. And Nixon signs it into law January or June 23rd, 1972. There have been many times that in the past when it has been challenged. Title IX has gone back to Congress many more times than most laws, 24 times by 2007, the last time that they were thinking or somebody was thinking of challenging Title IX. Rod Brooks, who was George W. Bush's Secretary of Education sent down an email 
asking students, do you think we should get rid of Title IX or not? You know what came back? There's no way we'll get rid of Title IX. And he signs the bill. He signs the bill. But when Nixon signs the bill, he doesn't talk about the bill. He talks about the segregation, busing. But he doesn't announce, uh, talk about the expansion of educational access for women. For it was an act, he was the one who enacted it. And it changed the lives of hundreds of millions of women in the United States, some in the world. Now, I never thought about this until I was doing some research. This woman is a woman by the name of Bernice Sandler. She was an activist in the 1960s and 70s out of New York. And it says, God bless you, Title IX. This is what she said. If girls got pregnant, they were literally kicked out of most schools. Very often, people who knew who the father was. He didn't receive any punishment at all. Women teachers also uh, face tough consequences for getting pregnant, routinely losing their jobs when they began to show. In New York City, if you were a woman in the 1920s and wanted a teaching job, you were not allowed to be married. Bernice Guerra was a baseball umpire. She's a queen house, queen's housewife around 1965. She's kind, of, she's kind of getting antsy and bored about being a housewife. And she's talking to her husband one day, and she says, you know, I don't like this, this, this thing. I don't want to be, I really don't want to be a housewife anymore. I want to do something. Well, what do you want to do? I don't know. Let me think about it. I like baseball. I know I want to be a baseball umpire. And she starts her rap to being a baseball umpire. 1969, Bernice Garrett received a contract from the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues to work in the Class A short season, New York Penn League. But she got a telegram from the head of uh, the NAPBL, uh, Phil Pite, saying, your contract is invalid. You're gone. Get out of here. Well, she sued. Baseball executive Ed Doherty claimed that umpires needed to be between the ages of 21 and 35, a minimum of 5 foot 10 inches tall, 170 pounds. She was 38. She was 5 foot 2, and she weighed 126 pounds. But she had some experience. She uh, umped for the National Baseball Congress in uh, Bridgetown, New Jersey, and according to court testimony, she was a, in umpiring in recreational programs in the slums. That's her quote, not mine. There she is. She becomes an umpire. Eventually, the New York State Division of Rights versus the New York Pennsylvania Professional Baseball League, the court ruled that a man is not a bona fide Bonafide occupational qualification for umpires. By the way, can a man screw up a call as well as a woman in a baseball game saying you're safe when you're out? Yeah, a woman could do that just as well as a man, right? What's the difference? On June 24th, the day after Nixon signs Title IX, after three years of court battles, she gets on the baseball field. And she's supposed to umpire a game between the Geneva New York Rangers and the Auburn New York Phillies, uh, the minor league teams of Philadelphia Phillies and Texas Rangers. And the game is in Geneva. And let me ask you a question. What kind of mentality is it that you go to a hotel where this woman is staying, throw a rock at a lamp at, uh, in front of the motel and start screaming uh, outside the, the, the woman's uh, hotel room. And this is like a Hotel 6. What kind of mentality is that? Because that's what she faced. Eight guys came to basically try to get her out of umpiring game. And there she is getting ready for the game. The night before, eight men cursed Gera and shattered the light outside of her motel room. The afternoon before the game, she stayed in her motel room, studied baseball plays, rules, and uh, she didn't eat. She had nerves, she didn't eat. And finally, she gets onto the baseball field. It's a double header between Philadelphia, Philadelphia Phillies farm team, Auburn, and the Texas Rangers farm team uh, in Geneva. And she's working the field. She's gonna work the field in the first game, behind home plate in the second game. 
Minor League Baseball, there are two umpires. One umpire covers the field, the other home plate. So she's out in the field and she makes a call. And it's against Auburn. And the Auburn manager is upset because she reversed the double play call. Uh, she resigned between games because she was not getting any help from the other umpire. Uh, Nolan Campbell was the uh, Auburn Phillies manager. And during the argument, uh, Campbell yelled at Bernice Gear, you should be in the kitchen peeling potatoes. Her umpiring uh, partner put his arm around Campbell, who she just threw out of the game, and that was it. She knew she was beaten. Her husband, Steve Garris, said, Bernice would always say, I can beat them in the courts, but I can't beat them on the field. The woman in blue. After the final out, she left the field, never to return again. When I got in the car, I broke down. She resigned between games of the doubleheader, saying there was a lack of cooperation from her fellow umpires. But critics said, you can't quit. Uh, they said her resignation would close the door to other women in baseball. But her response was, how could I close that door that was never opened? Billie Jean King, that's my father-in-law, Billie Jean King. He was a groupie. So he used to go out with me and cover stuff. Uh, Billie Jean King, civil rights pioneer, yes or no? Yes. How many say yes? Civil rights. Billie Jean King, okay. Yeah, she is a civil rights pioneer. Oh, she is. She is. She was a pioneer who captured uh, attention long before uh, the Battle of the Sexes <laughs> showdown uh, against Bobby Riggs at the Houston Astrodome in 1973. Well, Patsy Mink was pushing ahead in Congress, Edith Green pushing ahead in Congress, women's tennis was stuck in old traditions that left women athletes as second-class citizens. She decided it was time to change. There she is in 1967 known as Mrs. King in 1967. She, too, had no first name. In 1967, she takes on the United States Lawn Tennis Association and its policy of paying top players under the table to guarantee their entry into tournaments. She denounced the USLTA's uh, practices as corrupt and kept the game elitist. Well, the USTA remembered that and basically tried to blackball Billie Jean King three years later. Oh, 1968, she wins Wimbledon. She takes home 750 pounds. The man, the Australian who won, Rod Labor, got 2,000 pounds. Uh, the purses for the men, 14,800 pounds. Uh, for women, 5,680 pounds. At the 1970 Italian Open, the singles champion from Romania, Ilya Nastasis, paid 3,500 bucks. Billie Jean King gets 600 bucks. Uh, but uh, remember I talked about USLTA is mad at Billie Jean King and is looking to get even with her? They finally do in 1970. No women, no women tournaments. No women tournaments at all. Well, you can't make money without tournaments, right? Here's Billie Jean King in 1972. Before I get into that, Billie Jean King pushed for equal prize money in men's and women's games. After winning the U.S. Open in uh, Forest Hills in 1972, uh, she got $15,000 less than the Stassi. Uh, and she said, I'm not coming next year unless you equal the prizes. They did in 1973, the U.S. Open. You've come a long way. Remember the commercial, you've come a long way, baby, to get to where you are today. You got your own cigarette now, baby. You've come a long way. Remember that commercial? Condescending, that is as condescending as can be. But you got your own cigarette now. Virginia Slims was the cigarette. And uh, Philip Morris was the parent company of Virginia Slims. You've come a long way, baby. Cigarette, tennis racket in hand. 1970, there was a guy in Houston who decided, I want the women to come down here and play in the tournament. And they got Virginia Slims, or rather Philip Morris, to. Um, pay for the tournament. Well, nine women decide to be involved in that tournament. And the United States Lawn Tennis Association said, uh, you play in that tournament, you're never going to play again. We're going to make sure you'll never be, play you'll be blackballed. Uh, well, 
the original nine rebelled against the United States Lawn Tennis Association, partly because of pay. The nine, Billie Jean King, Rosie Casals, Nancy Ritchie, Peaches Barkowitz, Kirstie Pigeon, Valerie Ziegenfuss, Julie Heldman, Carrie Melville Reed, Judy Taggart Dalton. All nine players were putting their career at risk. And they basically said, we dare you. We absolutely dare you to get rid of us. We'll see what happens. Well, they called their bluff. And the, the tour starts. Now, Billie Jean King once told me it was blood money. They knew that they were taking blood money. But nobody was, they were banging on doors and nobody was willing to give them money except for Philip Morris and Virginia Slims. They knew that cigarettes cause cancer. Ellen Merlo was the director of marketing and communications for Philip Morris USA, which makes the Virginia Slim cigarette, and sponsored the tour from 71 to 78. She said, when we get involved in any promotion, it's obviously to create a greater visibility for our brand name. But we never, never ask the player to endorse our product. Not true. By playing in the tournament, you're endorsing Virginia Slims. Uh, Brandy Chastain was on the 1999 United States national team that won the uh, Women's World Cup in soccer. And about 10 years ago, we were sitting down and talking, and I said, you know, what's going on with women's sports? When is it going to become a big deal? Simple answer. We need a good old girls network. Not a good old boys network. We need a good old girls network. We need girls to make decisions. But the girls have to be CFOs of companies, and CEOs of companies, and presidents of companies. And they weren't turning them out all that fast when I spoke to her about 12 years ago. Even though Title IX about 12 years ago was 38 years old, it was getting there finally. How many of you had credit cards prior to 1974 in your own name? And I'm not talking about Gimbals and Bomb would tell her. Uh, or those, or I'm not talking about department store credit cards. I'm talking about American Express. I'm talking about, uh, uh, I guess it was Bank America card at that time. How many of you had those cards? Before when? Before 1974 in your own name. In your own name. Somebody co-signed for you? No. Father, brother? Real? what card was it? MasterCard. Was it MasterCard? Billie Jean King told me the story about credit cards prior to 1974. She couldn't get one. Most women couldn't get a credit card, major credit card, not for uh, Bob Teller or Gimbel's or Macy's or uh, any of those stores. Uh, many banks required single, divorced, or widowed women to bring a man along with them to co-sign for a credit card. Uh, and some discounted the wages of women by as much as 50% when calculating uh, their credit limits. Billie Jean King was telling me, I'm making all the money. Her husband was Larry King, not the Larry King on radio. Larry King's a lawyer. And she said that uh, he had to co-sign. Or her brother, Randy Moffat, had to co-sign. Her parents had to co-sign prior to 1974. Credit cards. Men had to co-sign. If you look at this ad, it says, Marine Midland has a credit card so safe, even your wife could use it. Prior to 1974. October 1974. See, you must have gotten your credit card a little later. Because prior to October 1974, women weren't able to get credit cards without a man co-signing it. It becomes law. Gerald Ford signs it. October 1974. Equal Credit Opportunity Act made it illegal to discriminate against someone based on their agenda, race, religion, or national origin. There was a bank for women, finally. A bank for women in 1975 in Manhattan was called the First Women's Bank, the bank of creation of the feminist movement. Established in April 1975, first bank only for women. Why? Because most banks didn't really want to deal with women and gave women a difficult time. Uh, unless a man was with them. Uh, but anyway, they gave loans to women. Now the bank, by 1986, is out of business. It was languishing because other banks were given 
uh, women money. It was sold to a group of investors who strengthened its finances and would eventually disappear. So there are the credits. Uh, a form of discrimination as late as 2010. Women still pay more for credit cards. Uh, according to a study from the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, women paid a half point higher percentage than men as late as 2010. Title IX opened the door for women in sports and other fields, including medicine and law. Title IX bars sex discrimination in any educational program or activity which receives federal funding. Title IX, there's Birch Bybee, Indiana Senator, along with uh, the Purdue University women's track team. Donna again, Donna Deverona. Title IX was a Civil Rights Act applied to education. Basically, it said law school, medical school. Sports was thrown in there. She's still lobbying in Washington to make sure nobody touches this law, like they touched the 1965 Civil Rights Voting Act which was gutted by the Supreme Court. Again, this thing is a law. It's not a right. It could disappear at any time. At its inception, opponents of the law argued that girls and women were not interested in elite sports participation uh, and that opening new opportunities would not only undermine men's sports, but bankrupt school sports budgets nationwide. John Tower was a senator from Texas in 1974. And he's the guy who really poisons Title IX and poisons the perception that, well, it's not an education law, it's just a sports law, so let's get rid of it. Senator Tower proposes the Tower Amendment, which would exempt revenue-producing re sports like college football from determinations of the Title IX compliance. The amendment is rejected, uh, but it does the damage. People start saying it's only about sports. It's not about law school or medicine or engineering, or other uh, schools. Jacob Javits, remember him? Yeah. Senator, New York, the only guy I didn't meet in the 1980 senatorial campaign when I was covering it. I also didn't meet Bess uh, Myers, I forgot she had run that year. It was uh, Carol Bellamy was involved, and uh, Liz Holtzman, and uh, also uh, Alphonse DeMotta. 1974, Javits submits an amendment directing the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to issue regulations that provide for reasonable provisions considering the nature of particular sports that clarifies event and uniform expense, uh, expenditures on sports with larger crowds and more expensive equipment do not have to be matched uh, in sports without similar needs. Meanwhile, if you're a girls team, wear old uniforms. If you're the football team, you've got to have only top of the line uniforms. Walter Byers was the head of the National Collegiate Athletic Association in 1976, started in the 1950s. His job? Protect all of the student athletes. Well, apparently in 1976, on February 17, 1976, Byers and the NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, challenges the legacy of Title IX. What was it about? Saving college football. There was a college football player during the pandemic by the name of Sarah Fuller for Vanderbilt University. They didn't have a kicker, so they went to the women's soccer team, and they found a kicker by the name of Sarah Fuller. Fight is all about sports now. Title IX changed how college sports played in the country. Before 1972, the U.S. General Accounting Office released a figure showing that only 32,000 women had participated in college sports. By 1999, 163,000. By 2018, 216,378. Uh, men no longer get 95% of the dollars earmarked for sports. And that's causing friction in the men's teaching, uh, rather men's teams, coaching fraternity, Good number of those coaches think Title IX has taken away their ability to get the best athletes for their teams because they can't spend all that scholarship money for just men's teams. Title IX, it's even the scales in other businesses that Brandy Chastain talked about. We need a good old girls network. Men's school programs, uh, uh, men's sports programs at schools have been eliminated, but Title IX was never ever meant to equalize the playing field. It was designed to give women a fair chance at being accepted at the school and women professors 
to get an equal opportunity at advancing within the system. Has Title IX worked, yes or no? Huh? What do you think? Has Title IX worked? Mm -hmm. How many of you have daughters and granddaughters who are professionals like doctors or lawyers or engineers? Yeah. What's your daughter or granddaughter? Well, uh, lawyer. She's a lawyer. Prior to, and I'm going to, this is from my experience. I graduated high school in 1973. So I know people who graduated in 72 and after 73. Prior to 1972, girls at Spring Valley High School were not told by their guidance counselors, you could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer. But after Title IX passed, they were told, and I know two girls who became lawyers, you could be a lawyer. No problem, you could be a lawyer. Uh, 1994, 38% of medical degrees earned in the United States women. 9% in 1972. 43% of law degrees in 1994 earned by women. 7% in 1972. Doct uh, doctorate degrees. This is hard to tell because sometimes it takes 10 years to get a doctorate. But 44% of all uh, doctorates uh, in 1974 went to women. 25% in 1977. So there's been a diversity in society that has been created because of Title IX. Oh, Shelly, put down the phone. You're not going to reach me. Yeah, I know your ears are burning because I'm showing a picture of you. That's 2015 in uh, Los Angeles. One of the five most influential men in women's sports in the 1970s. Uh, that was my friend, Shelly Saltman. Prior to 1972, very few women lawyers, doctors, scientists, nurse, teacher, secretary. That was the career for most women. Girls didn't play too many sports. Girls took square dancing and home economics. Guys couldn't take home economics. And you know what? Guys needed home economics. How many of you had husbands who could cook? How many of you had husbands who could cook? How many of you had husbands who couldn't cook? I can't. So I never took home economics. I'd take workshop. Without Title IX, there'd be no US Women's World Cup Championship soccer team, no WNBA. No professional women's sports leagues. Almost every female athlete in the U.S. today has benefited from Title IX in one way or another. And prior to 1972, there weren't many women scientists, mathematicians, or computer analysts. Now there are. Uh, but the question is, are women still second-class citizens in college? Well, at least in sports, they were in 2021, during the pandemic. The women's basketball tournament was held near San Antonio. The men's was held in Indianapolis. Uh, can you tell me which is the men's training room and which is the women's training room? If you could see it. That looks like my basement on the right. I have all those weights. That's my basement. That looks like a gym, doesn't it? That's the men's. That's the women's. Men's basketball tournament held in Indianapolis, 2021. Men's teams were given better COVID-19 tests, while people connected to the women's teams in the San Antonio area got a less accurate COVID-19 test. The training equipment available to the women's teams was not equal to what the men got. Oh, take a look at the food. Uh, does this look like a Swanson TV dinner? Look what the men, the men have a buffet table. The men have a buffet table. Food options, limited for women. And there were complaints about the swag bags, the stuff they give out for, uh, to the athletes, that the men got incredible gifts. The women literally got a t-shirt. And uh, there was an apology from this guy, Dr. Mark Emmert, who's the head of the National Collegiate Athletic Association until next June. He apologized, saying, I don't know how that happened. Uh, he said, none of this should have happened, but it did. Men and women did not get equal treatment in the COVID bubble in 2021. 2021, 49 years after Title IX. That is the stamp that came out in March, and that is Donna Deverona down in Washington. She sent me the picture. Hey, look at me. It's a stamp. And uh, the United States Postal Service put out a stamp honoring uh, Title IX, 50 years of Title IX. That came out in March. Donna, 
this is what she said to me. She said, I could use it in front of you. It will be my honor on March 3rd to celebrate the dedication of a Title IX stamp. Behind the images is five decades of dedication and support of what this legislation created for women in education and athletics. A shout out to all my friends who have given their time to travel to Washington to protect and support this law. So what's the future? What do you think the future is? What do you think the future is? Is it good or bad for Title IX? Well, look what, look what may happen in the Supreme Court in a few days. Women do not have the right to higher education. It's a law. Women need to know education is not a right, but is only guaranteed through federal law, and there are some provisions to that. And uh, that is a woman who uh, did not benefit necessarily from Title IX, the governor of Hawaii, Linda Lingle, in 2005. Uh, but it's going to be women like Linda Lingle who are going to make sure that Title IX does not disappear for future generations. As one of my friends said, there are too many women lawyers that, that uh, will not allow Title IX to die. Anyway, any questions, any comments? It's your turn to talk. Anybody have anything to say? No questions? So how many of you have professionals uh, besides you, uh, professional women uh, in your lives? What do you? Roe versus Wade, you talking about? Yes. 